Okay. So a little bit about myself. I'll introduce myself to you. So I am from Utah, born and raised here. When I was a college student, about most of your ages, uh, when I was a sophomore in college, my second year of college, I got married, uh, married my high school sweetheart, Paige. And when we were getting married, we about six weeks before we were getting married, we found out my wife had stage three cancer and she's fine now. So it's got a happy ending to it, but that's important to the story I'm gonna tell you. I was working at the time at Wells Fargo Bank as a teller and my wife had a job as well. And then we were gonna get married and then I was going to start a new job that I'd been offered at a different bank. And I got offered a job as a branch manager. It was a good job, as a, especially as a college student. They were gonna pay me like $62,000 a year which was good money for a college student in 2006. And so I was excited about that. So we find out my wife has cancer, which is a bummer. And then I quit my job at Wells Fargo. We get married, we go on our honeymoon. While we're on our honeymoon, I get a call from Huntsman Cancer Institute that said, hey, we tested the margin around the melanoma and it spread, which that's what it means by stage three. And so you need to come back. We need to get into surgery to take the lymph nodes out to see if it's how far it's spread. Terrible phone call to get on your honeymoon, right? So we're down in Mexico and we're both really upset. We're walking down the beach and we've scheduled our flights to fly out. And we're, we're getting ready to come home and we're both sad. I mean, it's a terrible thing. And as we're walking down the beach, my wife sees a sign on the beach that said, swim with the dolphins. And I think it was $150 to swim with the dolphins. And she lights up and she says, I've always wanted to swim with the dolphins. They've got dolphins here. Can we swim with the dolphins? And I'm like, heck yeah, if that makes you happy. Let's swim with the dolphins. But I remember I had like $125 in my bank account. That was all the money I had to my name. And I remember going up there to pay for it and thinking, please go through, just go through. And it did, the transaction went through, she swam with the dolphins, we flew home the next day, she went into Huntsman, and I have an overdrawn bank account. I show up to my first day of work at the bank that I was supposed to be working at, and I walk in, and there's somebody else sitting at my desk. And so I go up to him, I say, hey, I'm Phil, I'm here for the branch manager job. And they, this guy that's in my desk, gets this sick look on his face, and he says, oh, didn't you get our messages? I said, what messages? They'd been emailing me apparently to an email that I didn't use. They'd offered the job to somebody else. While I was on my honeymoon, they'd given the job to what ended up being the district manager's nephew. And so they pulled the job out from under me. Now, for those of you that are younger, this might not resonate with you, but before Obamacare, if you had a pre-existing medical condition like cancer, you couldn't qualify for insurance. You couldn't get insurance. My wife was at Huntsman Institute at that moment getting treatment. And I'm thinking, here I am, you know, I'm 23 years old. I have an overdrawn bank account. I have a mortgage. I bought a house making $10 an hour, which was a bad decision. But I've got a mortgage and I've got medical bills now that are uninsured. So that night I went home. This is the reason I'm telling you the story. That night I went home and I didn't sleep all night and I wrote down 100 ideas for starting a business. How could I make money? And I've still got that list. I've got it framed in my office. And a lot of the ideas were really dumb ideas. You know, one of them that I always tell my students is I, I sketched out a popcorn machine that would pop popcorn and you would put butter on top of the popcorn machine and the heat from the popcorn machine would melt the butter and it would create like a waterfall of butter. And then the popcorn kernels would shoot through the waterfall of butter. It sounds like it's not a bad idea until you think about individually buttered popcorn. If every kernel was drenched in butter, it'd be pretty gross, right? And so I wrote down 100 ideas. Most of them were stupid, but a couple of them, I narrowed it down to, okay, these might actually be good ideas. And one of the ideas that I settled on was a, um, a business where I would teach people classes. And, and the reason I thought about this idea is about a month or so earlier, I had attended a training course, and it was actually a concealed firearm permit class. So if you're familiar with Utah's firearm laws, if you want to carry a firearm, you can get a permit. And in order to get that permit, you take a four-hour class. You sit in a room like this, and somebody teaches a class. 
And I remember I'd taken a class and it was in my memory, it was sharp in my memory because the guy that taught it was terrible. He was just the worst. And it was a four hour class and there was like 20 people in the room. And the whole time I sat there and thought, this guy's making like 1500 bucks from this class and he's terrible. And so then I thought, well, I could do that. I could teach those classes. And I didn't know anything about that industry. So I looked up, how can I become an instructor to teach these type of classes? And then I started thinking, well, how could I teach other classes? Food handlers permit, forklift operator. What are some certifications or classes that I could get certified to teach and then I could teach them? So I started a company and I knew nothing. And I called the company Nelson Enterprises and I just started teaching people classes. Anybody that I could convince to pay me money to teach them a class. And the first class I ever taught were three people attended it. It was in my kitchen of my townhouse. It was my mom, my best friend, and then a Weber State professor. And I still think about that class and think, what was that Weber State professor thinking for that four hours that we sat in my kitchen and I taught my mom and my best friend and him this class. It must have been awful for him. But it worked. And I made, I remember I made $225 because my mom paid me double. And so I made, I made $225. And I took that $225 and I went on KSL classifieds and I thought, okay, I need to buy a projector. Because it would be way better to teach classes if I could like project a PowerPoint. And so I bought a used projector from a guy for like 125 bucks. And it was, I mean, it was this big. It was massive. It sounded like it, it was loud when you, when you turned it on. And I used that projector for the whole first year of running my business. And then the second class I taught, I had like five or six people. I made like $400. I took that money and I bought some business cards. And then I took the next class's money and I went and got some training so that I would actually know what I was talking about. And I started what we call snowballing the business, which is your cash flowing it. I didn't have any money. So I started this business literally with a negative bank account. So I couldn't invest in marketing or anything like that. I would go around to grocery stores and I would put flyers on people's windows. I would hang up flyers on, on uh, street corners, things like that. Really guerrilla marketing. And I did that for the first year. Now at the end of the first year, I think I made like $18,000 is what I made. So it wasn't making a ton of money, but we were staying alive. Right? My wife had got a job and we were paying the medical bills and we were staying alive. Uh, we were definitely broke. I mean, broke, 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 but we were staying alive. Continued running the business. The second year things started getting a little better and I was running the business with my brother, Jason. And uh, we started teaching more training classes. For him, it was a hobby. He had a real job. For me, it was my only way of making money. And they started getting a little better. And then we started working out agreements with stores, with retailers. And we went to places like Cal Ranch, if you're familiar with Cal Ranch. And we said, hey, we'll come into your store and we'll teach a training class. And it'll be like an event for your store. But it also gave us a place to teach the classes that wasn't in my kitchen. So it made us look more professional. And they liked it because it brought customers into the store. And at the end of that second year, I think I made like $40,000. So things were, things were growing, things were getting a little better. Well, I continued to run that business uh, for the next 10 years. So all the way through college, I continued to run it. I then went to law school and I continued to run that business all the way through law school. And then finally, we got to the point where we could, we could get our own office. And I love this picture because this was my first office. This was after, after I graduated from law school. So I had ran this business for uh, eight years now. And we came back and I was living in Northern Utah, North Ogden, and I finally felt like, hey, I can go get an office. And this is the office that I got. Now you can't see it very well, but it was like seven feet by eight feet. It was big enough to put a desk in, but I couldn't have somebody sit on this side of the desk because the door opened there. So I couldn't even have somebody sit there. And I thought I had made it. I remember I went there that night and I sat in the office and I thought, I've arrived. I've got an office, I've arrived. Now, understand, by this point, I was doing well over a million dollars a year in revenue. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about when I talk about some advice for people that wanna start a business is don't grow before you're ready to grow. You go out and get your fancy office and you get your vehicle wrapped with your logo and you buy, make some shirt and you go broke. So I was very scared. Remember, I'd started with zero money in my bank account. So I was never gonna take on debt. I was never gonna do anything like that. And by this stage, my company was doing pretty well, but I still didn't want to take on any kind of an occupational debt. So I think I was paying 
150 bucks a month for that office, I think is what I was paying. This was how I would do my scheduling. So my training company had grown to where at this point we were operating in about 14 states and I was teaching the classes in all 14 of those states. So every month I would schedule out my month of what state I was gonna be in, where I was gonna be teaching the classes, what city I would be in. And that's how much I was traveling, if you look at that calendar. Of 52 weeks in a year, I was traveling about 46 of them. And I look back, I just got a reminder, uh, and I'll come back to this one, but I just got a reminder on Facebook yesterday. This is a text message my wife had sent me 10 years ago yesterday. She said, where are you? What state are you in? And I said, huh, I'm in Iowa. And she said, okay, somebody asked me, I didn't know. I was traveling so much, my wife would wake up and have no idea, you know, it's still in town, it's still out of town. It was rough. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about too is the idea of starting a business of being an easier way to make a living is not the case. So what I would do is I would fly to a state like Wisconsin, I would rent a car, and then I would rent rental chairs, folding chairs like this, and I would stuff that car full of them. And believe it or not, this rental car right here had 75 folding chairs in it. And I would drive down the freeway throughout the entire state of Wisconsin and go from city to city, like a circus, you know, moving from city to city. And I would set up classes and I would put them all in the cheapest rental car that I could get. And I would teach these classes. And there's a Thomas Edison quote. It often gets misquoted. The actual quote is 2% success is 2% genius and 98% hard work. And that is just the reality. The reason that I was able to grow my business is because I was willing to do that. Right? And that was miserable. Like it was miserable. I would start out, for example, I would fly to Iowa and I would drive to Davenport, Iowa, which is I would fly into Omaha and drive eight hours to Davenport, Iowa, which is on the Illinois side. I would then teach a training class. I would finish that training class at nine o'clock at night. And then I would drive three and a half hours to the next city, get there at one o'clock in the morning, check into a hotel, go teach a training class at 7 a.m. the next day, teach another one at one o'clock in the afternoon and another one at at seven o'clock at night, I would teach three in a day and I would move from city to city to city, but I was making money. And so it was, it was great. Yeah. What kind of classes were you teaching? Okay, this primarily, the main product was the firearm trade. <clears throat> so what, this was 2008 and politically during that time, it was just a perfect storm. There was, it was the Obama years. There was a lot of firearm regulations that were changing. <clears throat> and so we were teaching mainly firearm training courses. That was our primary product. We did other training, but that was the one that made the most money. Yeah. These uh, last two or three years of this year, yeah. um, it's so, going to be really big requirement training. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about we'll that, how, how, how there's external factors that affect a business and being able to identify those. But you're exactly right. So I did that for years. And when I say years, I mean, from 2006 until 2014, I was doing that. I was traveling that much. In law school, I would go to my law school classes Monday through Wednesday. And when you go to law school, you have to sign a contract that you agree that you won't get a job. You're not allowed to have a job while you're in law school. If you have a job, they'll actually kick you out of school because it violates your student code of conduct. Well, what I would do is I would go to my classes Monday through Wednesday, and then Wednesday night, I would go catch a red eye flight out of Spokane International Airport and I would fly somewhere and teach classes Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I would fly home Sunday. So my law school never knew that, but I was doing that about 50 weeks a year going through law school. And it worked. It ended up working out. So after years, we finally built the business to the point where these were like the size of classes that we were teaching. We were teaching 30 of them a month, that size, everybody in that room is paying hundred dollars to be there. And it was a very profitable business for us. So as, as a law student, uh, I was regularly making more in a month than I make in a year now uh, as a salary. Uh -huh. Did you have employees like then? No, so that's a good question. Myself and my brother, we were flying around the country teaching the classes. And that's well, another thing that I teach in my classes, but that I'd also talk about here is knowing when to scale the business. So we were always having that debate of should we hire employees or should we do it ourselves? Every time you scale the business, there's a diminishing quality level. It's Walmart, right? The more employees you get, the less qualitative employees you're going to have. And so scaling a business is hard. These were such complicated courses. You couldn't just go teach them. You had to be certified by the state. You had to have all the credentials. It was hard to find the right people to hire. 
And so it took us a long time. I didn't hire my first employee until 2014. So I've been running the business for about eight years before I hired somebody. Uh -huh. um, I was listening to that, I, how you don't really expand your, your workforce. Um, that reminded me, I saw this documentary about a, about a Chinese company that, well, very big one that mm -hmm. is pretty much weaponized. It was left, like made the government really powerful, Tencent. Mm -hmm. It started off, the guy who founded it said, I'd rather have a team of five people than a team of like a thousand people because those five people will be dedicated to their work, yeah. that higher moral, higher morale. Yep. Whereas the thousand employees, if one guy just slacks off and it's doing good, everyone else yep. gets to have lower yeah. morale. And then not to take this on a tangent, but it's an excellent subject. If you want to study something called Price's Law, and when the Pareto distribution of prices law, what prices law says is that the square root of your employees will produce 50% of your labor. So in a group, you, you know this, if you've ever done a work project in college with 10 people, three of those people do 50% of the work and the other seven do the other 50%, right? There's three of them that are more productive. That's not a big deal in a group of 10. But then when you've got 100 people, now, all of a sudden, the square root of them are doing 50% of the work. You got 1,000 people. So Walmart, right, that's got 2 million employees. I don't know what the square root of 2 million is, but you got, you got 75 people that are doing 50% of the work, and the other 1,900,000. I mean, it becomes a very big problem with scaling an enterprise. That's why it's problematic. But anyways, back to the story. So. By 2015, we were operating in about 30 states, and the business had grown quite a bit. And I got to the point where I said, okay, how do I take it to the next level? What do I do? Because I can't keep traveling anymore. My kid was, my son was getting old enough that he was starting to play sports. And what happened is he registered for soccer. My wife came to me and said, his soccer games are going to be on these days, and you're not going to be able to be there. And I had this decision point. And so my decision was, nope, I'm going to be there. And so what I did is we sold a portion of the business to a venture capital group based out of Ohio who took on managing part of the business. So then their job was to hire employees and scale it and grow it. And that then took for me the need to travel every weekend. So I stopped traveling, uh, made money on that sale but retained an interest in the business and continued to run it and continued to operate the business. And then along the way, I did some other products. So I wrote, I've written 13 books um, that we published. I've built two mobile phone applications. The books have sold about, uh, at this point, we've done about 70,000 copies and the app has about 400,000 users. These are, products that went along with the business. So when you run a business that's successful, you start thinking about what are some ancillary products that I can bring to market that will go along with it. You know, what can I do? Amazon, obviously, their business is successful, but they were using UPS to ship all their packages. So they have the thought, why don't we internally do our own shipping? And Amazon has been doing that for the last few years. Um, and they're just additional revenue sources. Uh, my, Story was featured in Forbes in 2018. And then the present day where we're at right now is we have sold, I've sold my remaining interest in the business um, in 2022 to a group based out of Texas. Um, that Texas uh, group is then, they own about 50 companies and they have hired me on as their legal counsel. And then I do, um, I'm a director for three of their businesses that are kind of in the same industry. And so I help run those businesses. So that's the end of the story. And I told you the beginning of the story, but in the middle there, from 2006 to 2022, there were a lot of lessons learned and I'm not gonna be able to share all of them with you today, but I do wanna talk about a few of them. And this whole presentation, by the way, I will send it to Eric and Eric can send it out because it's got the steps, what I call it, the business startup steps, the idea generation step, the go to market steps, and then the, the the end, what is the end goal steps? And so I'll send it there and you can share with you. But there's a few things I want to talk to you about. First thing is, how do you come up with the right idea for a business? And I told you how I came up with my idea, but it was out of necessity. So one of the things that I think is important to understand is that one of the problems you're facing if you want to start a business is you might not have 
that same urgency. You know, in the US economy right now, most of you can go get a job for $55,000 a year. You can go work at Costco. And have you ever seen an unhappy Costco employee? Oh, yeah. Have you? Oh, I haven't. They're always smiling every time I see them. I've seen unhappy Walmart employees, but like Costco employees, I mean, it's not a bad life. You know, you're not going to be rich. You're not going to be taking the type of vacations you want to take, but it's a pretty secure, stable job. They'll give you insurance. They'll treat you well. And that's a problem for entrepreneurs because the only reason I started a business is I had no other options. Had I had a Costco option, I, had I got that job at the bank, if I just showed up that day and that job was there for me, my entire life is different. This whole entrepreneurship story doesn't exist. So hardship, necessity, if you're broke, which you probably are, right? You're going to Salt Lake Community College. Why are you going to Salt Lake Community College instead of Westminster right now? Probably because you don't come from family money. That's my guess. Anybody got trust funds? I didn't have a trust fund, right? I didn't have family money. And it was, it was necessity. And so that's good. Necessity is a good thing. It drives you to think about how can I get out of the situation I'm in? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's not just because you go to like a community college, you're like very broke. Like you can have like millions of dollars and sure. you are not going to spend it like unwisely, you, you can save a lot more. True. Just, yeah, don't don't be offended by what I was saying. I was a broke, yeah. I was a broke college. Student. Just saying. Yeah. So I'm saying that's that's the it's average. Sometimes it's not smart. You know? Yes. No, I agree. Yeah, you could be wise with your money for sure. But I wasn't. I was broke. I didn't have money to be wise with. And so that's what drove me to want to start a business. So necessity is often one of the good things. A, a, a high unemployment rate is bad for the economy. It's good for entrepreneurship because it forces people out of their comfort zone to start businesses. So that's a good thing. So why do you start a business? Now, if you were thinking about starting a business today, what's the number one reason that comes to mind of why you want to have your own business? Money. Money, right? And it is very true. Like the, the your best pathway, the richest people that I know. So in my law practice, I do estate planning, which is helping people set up their estates so that they don't lose it to taxes or whatever. There's multi-generational wealth type of stuff. The richest people I deal with, they all own their own businesses. Now I do have clients that are very well-paid doctors and physicians. They don't have nearly the money that the business owners have. So that's good, that is true. The upside of owning a business is that you get the money from it. What's the downside? All the work you have to do. They can't yeah. lose it. Yeah. End of the month shows up. Who pays your bills? You don't get a paycheck. So regularly, for months, if not years at a time, you will go to work, work every day, and get to the end of the month, and you'll have lost money. So can you imagine paying to go to your job instead of making money at your job? That's what entrepreneurship is for most people. So the money, yes, but it can't be your only factor because you very well may lose money for, for years starting that business at a time. Thanks, Phil. So, yeah. so money is always the first answer that I get from people. What else? Why else might you want to be an entrepreneur? Yeah. That's just to do things I want to do. Yeah. Yep. Lifestyle flexibility. So maybe you want to spend time with your kids, your family, your loved ones. You don't want to go to work eight to five and commute every day. So lifestyle flexibility, um, more direct, you make your own decisions. You're not subject to somebody else. You don't have to ask somebody else for a lunch break. You can do what you want to do. Now, everything is a double-edged sword. That's the positive side. The negative side is as an entrepreneur, you will not have time off. You will work 80 to 100 hours a week. Your phone will buzz <laughs> on a weekend while you're out on a date with your spouse and you'll look at it. And so that is a, you have to prepare yourself for that side of things, the never ending, you're on a vacation with your wife and kids, but you're sneaking off to look at your laptop so you can answer emails so that you're not getting behind on things. That is, if you got a regular job, you work at Costco, you go on vacation, you're on vacation. I don't think I've ever felt what a vacation's like for that person, because I'm always looking at what's going on, answering emails, doing that. So that's the, the that's the downside. But the positive side is, yeah, it's a Wednesday. You wake up, your kid's got a presentation they're given in school. You can go to that presentation. You can set your own schedule. 
it means you'll work till one in the morning that night, but you can you can move that around. So yeah, that's great. Okay, now we're kind of running out of time, so I want to take time for questions, and I know it took us a while to get started, but a few lessons that I want to want to convey on entrepreneurship. The first is once you have your idea, your idea for a business idea, you need to look to the future and see how viable that idea is. How much time have you all spent? looking at things like chat GPT and some of the AI stuff that's coming out. Those of you that are my students, how much have you heard me talk about chat GPT every day for about 20 minutes of class? I mean, it's going to disrupt industries that, so those of you that are thinking about being lawyers, I told my students today, I don't think lawyers as a profession will exist in 15 years. So you're eight years away from becoming a lawyer. You don't want to become a lawyer if the entire profession is gone. Chat GPT-4 that just got released passed the bar exam in the top 10 percentile of all attorneys. So it's, it's already a better attorney than I am. I, I wasn't in the top 10%. So it's already a better lawyer than I am. And it's in its beta testing stage. Uh -huh. But like, do you really think you will be able to like be a lawyer, like yes. analyze the situation? Yeah, it already can. That's what I'm saying. It's already, I mean, we're at, we're at beta. This is testing stages and it's already, that's what the bar exam is. The bar exam is here is this very complicated fact pattern. Analyze every aspect of it and then communicate it to a client in a way that they'll understand. And it's already doing that at a higher level than almost any attorney can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You brought up the AI. So I'm actually a commissioned artist. I set up my DEA last year. Sweet. And when I heard you bring up the AI, I was like, oh, Gosh, yeah, the whole art community hates yeah, yeah. some even thought that that yeah. was something that, yeah, it, they're terrible with hands, like hands just seem to yeah, be the one. So, hit Mid Journey, the Mid Journey 5 that just got released, Mid Journey is the image creation AI. So, you tell it, make me a picture of a cat playing a piano on a desert island, right? Uh, Mid Journey 5 just got released and it is exponentially better than Mid Journey 4 was. So, I, my company, a big expense for us is we have to hire photo shoots to, for example, I'm building out a suite of educational courses right now for Mace, the pepper spray company. And um, we have to do photo shoots, people getting sprayed in the face with pepper spray. I don't know if you've ever been sprayed in the face with pepper spray, but it's awful. And we have to do like 20 of these photo shoots. They're hard, they're expensive to set up. You have to pay people a lot of money to spray them in the face of pepper spray, <laughs> take pictures of them. Well, we're using Mid Journey to generate all those images and we're generating hundreds of variations of somebody getting sprayed in the face of pepper spray in two minutes. And they're, they're, they're better than the images we can take pictures of. They're, they're, they're scenario-based stuff. There are some things we can use the AI, the art, the AI artists. And yes. plus, unfortunately though, when you go after something that that people do as a hobby, you're going to get horrid back. Yes. They are going to, no, they, yeah, not, they know how to, yep. they know how to uh, take it apart. Yeah. But they, what's the word? Uh, sabotage the AI. This, yeah. Because a lot of the AI use tagging. Yes. It, that AI is going to get sabotaged. So, so let me, let me backtrack. So I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. We've only got a couple minutes. My point in bringing that up is right now what you should be looking at is what are the business opportunities this presents, right? You've got businesses that are owned by old people. They don't understand what this is. They've heard about it. They've heard about ChatGPT. And right now they pay, you know, I pay, my company probably pays about $25,000 a month for customer service tasks. If you come to me, so you analyze that, that's, that's a lot of money over the course of a year. If you came to me and said, hey, my business helps your business set up AI customer service. So we will set up a system that will, instead of you having to pay people to answer the phone or to answer emails, we'll build this AI model that will do it for you. I mean, think of that. I'm paying, you know, in a given month, I'm paying for, in a given year, I'm paying three, four $400,000 for that customer service. If you sold that to me for $150,000, I'm still making a net profit of $200,000. So there are a lot of opportunities that are being presented. And that's just one industry. So I am here at the college. If you have any questions, Eric will have my contact information. I will send this whole presentation to him so he can share it with you, but I appreciate you letting me come talk to you. I know we're out of time, but it's, uh, it's fun. I hope to see you in some of my classes.